Uh, welcome to the 2023 research briefings. I'm Sue Wessler, the departing Home Secretary, and it's, it's my privilege to chair what's going to be three sessions, one before lunch and two after lunch. And the reason there are three sessions is we have two uh, classes where that we're, we're hearing speakers from the 2021 and the 2022 class and as many of you know this was caused uh, by the pandemic like everything else it's bad um, so every year we feature presentations from newly elected members from from our six classes and these individuals the, these wonderful scientists are chosen by their peers by their section and chair and they're chosen for their ability to give um, wonderful talks to more general audiences, scientifically um, educated, but, but general uh, audiences. So I don't want to take too much of their time. Our first speaker is Catherine J. Moore. Uh, she is elected in 2021. She represents class six is section on animal nutrition and applied microbial sciences. Uh, she is the Jean and David Blackman Professor of Cardiology and Director of the Cardiovascular Research Center at NYU's Grossman School of Medicine. Her title is Dark Matter Illuminates Cholesterol Metabolism. Catherine. Thank you, Dr. Wessler, and good morning, everyone. It's truly an honor to be here today representing Class 6, and I'd like to thank the Academy and my colleagues for giving me this opportunity to share my research with you. Uh, the topic of my talk today is going to be the dark matter of the genome, those stretches of our DNA that do not code for proteins and were overlooked for so long. Two large collaborative research projects led by international scientists changed all this, the Human Genome Project and the ENCODE Project, which together illuminated the dark matter and revealed many classes of non-coding RNAs and unexpected new modes of gene regulation. And this has had an impact on many different areas of science, um, including the regulation of cholesterol metabolism and its fine tuning, which is the topic of my talk today. Cholesterol is essential for cellular function and human physiology, but only in a narrow range of abundance. Too little or too much cholesterol can have detrimental effects. <laughs> cholesterol is an essential component of our cell membranes, and cholesterol is also used by the body for the generation of hormones and bile acids that can help in the digestion of a fatty meal. But too much cholesterol can lead to metabolic diseases, such as atherosclerosis, that are all too common in our society today. And on the left here, you can see a cartoon with a patient talking to his doctor saying, gravity has lowered my chest, my stomach, and my butt. Why hasn't it lowered my cholesterol? <laughs> and if only life were that simple. But as you'll hear in my talk, the maintenance of proper levels of cholesterol in our bodies and our cells requires a complex, multi-layered regulatory network that continually undergoes fine-tuning. The study of cholesterol has a long and storied history, starting over 200 years ago with the discovery of cholesterol in human bile and gallstones by Poultier de La Salle. And Cholesterol metabolism to date has received four Nobel Prizes, most recently in 1985 to Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein for their discoveries of the LDL receptor and the study of mechanisms of cholesterol synthesis. The study of cholesterol metabolism also led to the development, discovery and development of the statin class of drugs, which lower cholesterol levels and have revolutionized our treatment of cardiovascular disease in the modern era. In 2008, Akiro Endo was recognized for, for his contribution to this discovery with the Lasker Award. And in what would turn out to be a, a fortuitous coincidence, it was also the year that Victor Ambrose, David Balcom, and Gary Rovkin received the Lasker Award for discoveries of tiny RNAs that regulate gene function. Um, 
Gary Rubkin was my colleague at the time at Massachusetts General Hospital, and uh, a serendipitous elevator com conversation led to a collision of these two worlds of cholesterol metabolism and tiny RNAs that completely changed the direction of my research. The dogma for so many years was that DNA was transcribed into RNA and then translated into protein. But we now know that this only happens with 2% of transcripts. The remainder, the, the remaining 98%, is non-coding RNA. And it was once discarded by scientists as genomic junk, but we now know that this non-coding RNA is highly functional and can be classified in multiple different subclasses of RNAs, such as small nuclear RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, small nuclear uh, nucleolar RNAs, transfer RNAs, long non-coding RNAs, this large class, and microRNAs, those tiny RNAs that Gary Rufkin and his colleagues were studying. MicroRNAs are encoded in our genome, um, and after being transcribed, they can be processed, and they can affect the translation of other genes. They bind to the mRNA and inhibit its translation into protein. And in this way, microRNAs provide a way for fine-tuning of gene expression. A single microRNA can reduce a, a gene expression by approximately 10 to 30 percent. But one of the really interesting things about microRNAs is that they can act as pathway regulators. So a microRNA can bind to multiple different genes in a pathway, and the cumulative effects of those small repressions can have a large effect on biological function. And when I started thinking about these gene networks and discussing this with Gary, it made me start to think about the complex network of genes that controls cholesterol metabolism. There are over 100 genes that are in this network that regulate cholesterol synthesis and its transport through the body on lipoproteins such as LDL. And I wondered whether microRNAs could control these gene networks. So we began with a very simple screen. We compared microRNA expression in cells that were loaded with cholesterol or cells that were depleted of cholesterol. This work was carried out by a very talented postdoc in my group, Katie Rayner, and in collaboration with my colleague, Carlos Fernandez Hernando. And we hit upon a very interesting microRNA, MIR-33. MIR-33 was increased when, when cells were depleted of their cholesterol, and we found that it was hidden in the introns of another gene, SREVF2. This was a gene that had been discovered by the Nobel laureates Brown and Goldstein to be a master transcriptional regulator of genes involved in cholesterol synthesis and uptake. And we showed that when this gene was transcribed, it made not only the transcription factor that was going to turn up cholesterol synthesis, but also the microRNA, which we discovered could reduce levels of transporters and other genes involved in the efflux of excess cholesterol. Um, you can see here in this last column that when MIR-33 is expressed in cells, we have lower levels of these proteins, ABCA1 and ABCG1, which are cholesterol transporters, and NPC1, which helps move cholesterol from the lysosome into the cytoplasm for excretion. Um, and these genes play important roles in the pathways that protect us from excess cholesterol, here you can see ABCA1 mediating cholesterol efflux from macrophages that accumulate in atherosclerotic plaques, and it also plays an important role in the creation of HDL particles, that good cholesterol that protects us from atherosclerosis. Um, and HDL is a good cholesterol because it can pick up excess cholesterol and transport it back to the liver for excretion. We found that when MIR-33 was uh, expressed in cells, the level of this efflux, both from the macrophages and the liver, was decreased. And so we'd identified this really interesting circuit of a transcription factor and a microRNA that could work together to boost cholesterol levels in the cell. And we reasoned that if MIR-33 could inhibit these pathways leading to cholesterol efflux and HDL 
generation, perhaps we could use inhibitors to increase these pathways. To look at this, we fed mice uh, a Western diet, the equivalent of hamburgers and french fries for 14 weeks. Mice are naturally protected from atherosclerosis, but we give them atherosclerosis by doing this. And then we treated them uh, with antimere 33, which is an antisense oligonucleotide that inhibits mere 33, a control antimere or PBS. And we found that only four weeks of treatment with this antimere could raise plasma levels of HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, by 40%. And importantly, it could reduce the amount of plaque that these mice had. You can see here the treatment with antimere 33. There's a 30% reduction in these plaques. And not only were the plaques smaller, I've outlined them here to make them easier to see. They were less inflamed and had uh, fewer regions of necrosis, this, this white area that makes the plaques unstable and susceptible to rupture, which is what causes heart attack and stroke. And this was very exciting because this suggested that MIR-33 could be a therapeutic target for the treatment of atherosclerosis. But there are a lot of differences between mice and men, including an extra copy of MIR-33 in, in humans and non-human primates that's hidden in a related gene called SREBF1. So we wondered whether our strategy would be equally effective in the face of two of these copies of MIR-33. So we... Uh, did a study in vervet monkeys. These are non-human primates that have both copies of MIR-33. And this was a 12-week study where we treated with our anti-MIR-33 or control anti-MIR, both on a normal diet and on a Western diet to simulate what, what we would see in the general population. And we were gratified to find that as we had seen in mice, MIR-33 treatment shown here in the blue trace caused a sustained increase in HDL cholesterol levels, even in the face of this very uh, high-fat diet. And importantly, we found that this was selective. We were raising levels of HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, but not LDL cholesterol. And this was a very exciting time in my lab. We had gone from the discovery of MIR-33 to testing its inhibition in mice and monkeys and showing that we could have a measurable impact on this clinical factor that's thought to be important for protecting from atherosclerosis. And this all happened in the span of two and a half years. It was an incredible time in science where the pace of discovery was, was really accelerated. But it turned out that we were seeing just the tip of the iceberg at that point. Um, in the ensuing years, we went on to show that MIR-33 could also fine-tune pathways of fatty acid oxidation, mitochondrial metabolism, autophagy, adaptive thermogenesis, and work by others showed its role in insulin signaling, bile acid synthesis, and secretion. And the positioning of MIR-33 within the SREBF genes really uniquely positions it as a, a strong metabolic regulator and fine-tuner of all of these pathways. Along the way, we also saw the discovery of many more microRNAs that could regulate cholesterol metabolism genes. MIR-33 was the first one described, but over the next decade, we saw many, many more um, described to regulate these pathways. And what was interesting is that they formed this very complex regulatory network with multiple microRNAs targeting the same genes. And this raised new questions about how these microRNAs interact, how they're coordinated, and how does, how does this work in the face of so much redundancy? We wondered if there was a higher order co coordinating the actions of these microRNAs. By that time, we had moved on to more of the dark matter. We'd started studying long non-coding RNAs. These are very abundant in the human genome. They're up to, it's estimated to be up to 60,000 link RNAs. Um, they're non-coding transcripts, more than 200 nucleotides, and fewer than 10% are functionally characterized. So there's tremendous opportunity for discovery in this area. Interestingly, they're poorly conserved, meaning that many of them are human-specific or primate-specific, 
representing a large opportunity for discovery uh, in human health and disease. Um, link RNAs have been shown to take on many different functions, but one in particular that we were interested was this role in sponging microRNAs to act as a competitive inhibitor of microRNAs. We had identified a long non-coding RNA called Cromer. This was a, a link RNA present in a locus on human chromosome 2 that was previously linked to premature coronary artery disease and uh, plasma levels of HDL cholesterol. And we found that uh, Cromer was increased in response to cellular and dietary cholesterol. But what was interesting was it seemed to have uh, an inordinate amount of microRNA binding sites for several microRNAs involved in regulating cholesterol efflux and the formation of HDL. And although I don't have a lot of time to show you the data, we found that Cromer could act as a sponge for these microRNAs, these uh, four functionally related microRNAs. And when we knock down Cromer using GATMERS, the levels of these microRNAs are increased in the cell. This causes a decrease in the ABCA1 cholesterol transporter and a reduction in cholesterol efflux and uh, the formation of HDL particles. And so if we put this all together, what we were seeing was a new layer to the regulation of cholesterol homeostasis. Under low cholesterol conditions, the microRNAs can repress these transcripts and block cholesterol efflux from the cell, leading to lipid accumulation. But as that lipid accumulates and there's excess cholesterol in the cell, Cromer is induced and it's able to draw those microRNAs away from the transcripts and uh, freeing them to allow the cholesterol mobilization and efflux from the cell. And this is an example of what I think will, will just be really the tip of the iceberg of a many-layered regulatory network that we find, found that fine-tunes cholesterol to allow it to be in that optimal range to uh, prevent disease and, and ensure human health. And so as I end, I would like to thank the many members of my lab that contributed to this work. Um, there are many more that I couldn't fit on the slide, um, as well as my collaborators that played instrumental roles in the microRNA and link RNA studies. And um, I'd also like to thank my family who are here in the audience today for their continual support of me on this journey. And thank you very much for your attention. We have a few minutes for questions, and if you want, you could go to the mic. Anybody? It's a shy crowd this morning. It's a, well, this is the first speaker. You're first. Okay, so if this, you want to go to the mic? Beautiful talk. Can you comment on how those microRNAs themselves are expressed and regulated by some transcription factors, maybe? Um, so one of the interesting things about MIR-33 is it's in an intron of another gene. So it's regulated when that gene is regulated. So factors that turn on transcription of the SREBF transcription factors cause transcription of the microRNA that, that then can be processed. But for other microRNAs, that's not always the case. MIR-33 is not unique, but it's a little bit special in that way. For other microRNAs, they're present in our genome, and they have promoters, and, um, and they can be independently regulated by various transcription factors and, and stimuli as, as normal genes or protein coding genes are. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nina Jablonski. She is the Evan Pugh University Professor of Anthropology at Penn State University. She's a represent, she represents Class 5's section on anthropology. Her title, title of her talk is Human Skin Color as a Biocultural Adaptation and More.
Thank you, Dr. Wessler, and thank you, colleagues, especially to those in class five for affording me this wonderful opportunity. It's fantastic to look at human beings. We're visual animals, and we put a lot of importance on how we look. And skin color is one of the most important of these externally visible characteristics. I didn't start out in my life as a biological anthropologist studying the evolution and meaning of skin color or the evolution of skin, but the pathway there was fascinating. I grew up in upstate New York picking up fossils on my driveway. And when I showed these beautiful things to my parents, they explained to me when I was age three or four, that they were the products of life that had lived in a great inland sea at my home that existed 400 million years ago. I couldn't quite wrap my head around this, <laughs> but they were beautiful and I was fascinated. And throughout my life as in high school and as an undergraduate biology major, I fostered an interest in evolution. I became more and more interested in human evolution. And I realized in the mid-1970s that I could actually study this as a graduate student. So I went off against my parents' wishes. They wanted me to go to medical school. I went off to study biological anthropology, just about the most impractical sounding thing. But I was feverishly interested in it. And I started studying the evolution, not of humans, but of old world monkeys that occurred in places like Old of I Gorge, where that picture was taken in the mid-1980s, after I had received my PhD at the University of Washington. I continue to this day to still study the evolution of old world monkeys and other non-human primates and do field work in various parts of the world, in East Africa and in China. But uh, along that way, I took a job at the University of Western Australia. And it was at that time that this serendipitous road of studying the evolution of human skin and skin color began. As these things often happen, a colleague asked me to fill in for him because he was going to a conference and needed someone to give a lecture for him in the course in human biology on the introduction to human skin. Now I knew something about human skin, so I did some special studying and was incredibly frustrated to find that there was precious little in 1991 that was known about the evolution of human skin and skin color. And the only paper of any merit that I could find that was interesting was a paper by Branda and Eaton published some years earlier in Science about the critical vitamin folate, vitamin B9, that was sensitive to simulated sunlight. And the authors opined in this paper that perhaps this had something to do with the evolution of human skin pigmentation. Nothing happened to this paper at the time, but three weeks after I gave that lecture in 1991, I was listening to a lecture being given by my colleague at the University of Western Australia, Professor Fiona Stanley, the woman you see on the far left here. She and Carol Bauer, on her left, were studying in one of the largest case control studies of the time, the relationship between folate deficiency and critical birth defects called neural tube defects, and we see some of the parts of the, of the neural tube here that can be affected by folate deficiency. Folate is responsible for promoting and regulating DNA production, and so it has everything to do with this early uh, embryogenesis that occurs in all vertebrate embryos. So I was sitting here thinking, hold on, there's a connection. And it was at this point that the light really went off because I realized that 
if there was a physical factor in the environment, sunlight, that could exert effects, deleterious effects, on folate levels that were necessary for DNA production and normal production of embryos and many other functions in the body, that this had real evolutionary significance. It's been known, it had been known for a long time, that sunlight, and specifically ultraviolet radiation, was really importantly correlated to, to skin pigmentation. But previous hypotheses about the relationship between intensity of sunlight and skin cancer didn't seem to hold much weight because skin cancer mostly afflicted people after reproductive age. So the idea that we might have an agent, folate or an agent in ultraviolet radiation that might affect folate levels and reproductive success was an important insight. And so we really formed, at this point, our original hypothesis in the early 1990s about darkly pigmented skin being protection against folate breakdown in the body, folate being necessary for so many processes, including normal embryo formation and normal sperm formation in men. The dark pigment eumelanin, which, uh, which imparts most of the color to human skin, is absolutely remarkable, and it's used throughout invertebrate and vertebrate evolution. Most of the, of the reptiles, birds, mammals, and humans that we see around us have eumelanin in their skin that imparts color to them. And it can be packaged in ingenious ways so that it, it, in its native form, you see it as very dark, but also it can be layered in various ways to refract light and create beautiful colors in the feathers of birds, for instance. So it's an amazing absorber of visible light, it also is a highly effective absorber of higher energy wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation, ultraviolet radiation, and even higher ionizing radiations. So it's a remarkably effective natural sunscreen on top of being a colorant. So then our, our challenge really began, OK, let's put this on an empirical footing. And it was easily enough said, but we didn't have, for the longest time, any access to good data on ultraviolet radiation at the Earth's surface, until in the late 1990s, the first data sets collected by NASA from NASA TOMS satellites became available. We asked for a scientist at NOAA to send us one of these DVRs at the time. There were no online downloads available. And thanks to my very, very con uh, creative and statistically agile husband, George Chaplin, my, my main collaborator in this work, who is a GIS expert, he was able to take all of this excellent remotely sensed UV data and translate it into excellent and beautifully uh, colored maps that showed ultraviolet radiation at the Earth's surface during various seasons or and as an annual average here. And this is UV MED, which is basically UVB, the most bioactive set of wavelengths of UV that reaches the Earth's surface. One of the important things that we can notice here is that the hottest areas, the highest UV, are close to the equator, which people had known for a long time. But in a very important point that we recognized was just how much of the habitable land surface of the world existed in these very low and highly seasonable, seasonal UV zones. This turns out to have a remarkably important uh, effect on the evolution of human skin pigmentation. So 
in our early studies, we demonstrated a very high correlation between ultraviolet radiation, these bioactive UVB wavelengths especially, and skin reflectance, the way that skin pigmentation or skin color is actually measured. And 86% of the variation in skin color is accounted for just by variation in UVR alone, not temperature, not rainfall, not humidity or other physical factors. So we knew we were on to something. And so we were really able then to sort of flesh out this early part of our hypothesis that eumelanin, this marvelous natural sunscreen pigment, protected against the breakdown of, of agents that would cause alteration in DNA, sorry, oops, that would cause alterations in DNA production and modification and these were important in embryo formation and spermatogenesis as well. So we figured we had a good part of the, of the solution there. What we didn't realize and what I've been able to work on since in the last 10 years at the lab of Larry Kenny and colleagues at Penn State is that folate this incredibly important proton donor, uh, vitamin in, in human physiology, is also essential for regulating temperature because of its role in helping to control the dilation of blood vessels in our skin. So when you need to sweat in order to stay cool in a hot environment or during exercise, you need folate as well as many other interactions uh, helping to modify the tone of your blood vessels so that you can uh, lose heat from the surface of your body. So a picture came together that our humans, our ancient human ancestors, these early members of the genus Homo, who were tall and strapping and physically very active, doing a lot of high-speed walking and probably a good deal of running uh, in the early years of our ancestry were not only mostly naked and their bodies mostly lacking invisible hair, but also had the capacity for tremendous sweating and had eumelanin permanently in their skin as an effective protection against the strong ultraviolet radiation close to the equator. And so we could then really recreate a good timeline, a hypothetical but still empirically supported timeline for the evolution of the human skin from a time when we shared an ancestor or the time of our close uh, ancestors, our relatives back here during our early days as early bipeds when we had probably chimpanzee-like skin, mostly covered with dark hair, during a, to a time when we, around the origin of the genus Homo, began to lose a lot of our body hair and gain permanent protective eumelanin pigment. This process continuing through the evolution of modern humans in equatorial Africa to Homo sapiens. So, we figured by that time we had answered part of this question. But of course, human skin comes in a variety of fantastic, beautiful colors, all the range of the sepia rainbow, including very, very light colors. And so we were trying to understand better how light skin or depigmented skin evolved. We recognize, based on earlier work, that vitamin D was part of this study because vitamin D, which is essential for the functioning of most organ systems in our body, is produced primarily by the reaction of cholesterol-based compounds in our skin with ultraviolet B wavelengths that come in contact with our skin. UV is mostly harmful to biological systems, but it's really important for all terrestrial vertebrates because it catalyzes the formation of vitamin D in the skin. And most of us, and most 
other of our relatives can get vitamin D only through this means. There are relatively few foods that actually contain vitamin D naturally. So we knew that the secret to understanding the full picture of human skin color evolution had to do with both folate and vitamin D. So back here to our, to our map, and we tried to understand the evolution of Homo sapiens, modern humans, with respect to ultraviolet radiation levels. Knowing that early humans evolved uh, to their anatomical, mostly modern state by about 300,000 years ago in equatorial Africa, we tried to understand what occurred first within the continent of Africa because we have spent most of our history as a species and all of the time that we were developing our linguistic, cultural, anthropological, technological sophistication in Africa over the first 200,000, 250,000 years of our history, we then see small populations in pursuit of food going into the Afro-Arabian Peninsula and out of equatorial Africa and out of Africa entirely. It's important to recognize here that these groups were small. Almost all of these dispersals that we talk about of human groups through time are of small populations carrying small fractions of the human genome tiny subsamples that are not representative of all of human variation. This sort of shuffling of the deck of cards of the human genome had a tremendous effect on the pigmentation genes that were subsequently acted upon by natural selection. So as humans move around in these dispersals and then Later in human evolution, in modern human evolution, into northwestern Europe and northeastern Asia, into these gray and ominously low UV zones, including those in the northern part of the, of the Americas, we wonder, well, what was going on with respect to pigmentation? And we inferred that this had to do with loss of pigmentation under natural selection. The man on the left can produce vitamin D in his skin much faster than the man on the right. And so the, then uh, our responsibility was the description of how this occurred. And we realized that when we look at these mostly lightly pigmented individuals from Northwestern Europe and Northeastern Asia, they both lack pigment, and our geneticist colleagues have helped to show that, in fact, the genetic foundations leading to these depigmented states actually evolve mostly independently, a beautiful illustration of the action of natural selection. So when we have populations living in the depths of, of highly seasonal UV, such as in Scotland, we see maximally depigmented skin and vitamin D-rich foods being eaten by people of necessity because there isn't enough UVB in the sunlight to catalyze the formation of the vitamin D that is needed to stay healthy, a process that we call the vitamin D compromise. Similarly, my geneticist colleagues in various labs have shown that dark and highly tannable skin, shown here in the beautiful women from Africa, Polynesia, and southern India, their dark and highly, highly tannable skin is afforded by different suites of genes in many cases, not the same ones. So there's a tremendous palette of genes, as it were, that is brought to bear and that has been under strong natural selection. Remember, humans were naked for most of their history, and we were for most of our history, even though we now wear clothing and live in buildings. So this great lability of skin color, the evolution of myriad similar skin colors under similar ultraviolet conditions, means that skin color itself has no value in classification. 
That didn't stop people 300 years ago from, of course, using skin color to create races and create race hierarchies. It's very hard for us to put this toothpaste back in the tube because most of the physical and social infrastructure of the world has been based on color-based races and racism. But science can play a part in this long process of restorative justice. So really to conclude, what we see is skin pigmentation is a beautiful evolutionary compromise between the demands of photo protection and photosynthesis under conditions of low ultraviolet radiation. And that in the history of the evolution of skin pigmentation, we see that it's been a contingent and non-deterministic process depending on where humans have been and what genes they've, they've inherited from their ancestors. That it's involved an in interplay of genetic, environmental, and cultural factors. And that it has never been an equilibrium, largely because of the genetic factors and the factors having to do with differences in solar radiation in the period that humans have been on Earth. So this is a remarkably labile system. Skin pigmentation has an inordinate effect on our social interactions today. We need to understand this. We can't dismiss skin color and color-based races as a social construct. Rather, we have to use our understanding to work to educate the young people all over the world to this myriad beautiful characteristic and its unfortunate ramifications. Many people are behind this work, notably my husband George Chaplin, who did so much work with me on the mapping of these factors, my research assistant Tess Wilson, and myriad fellowships uh, granting agencies and colleagues who have generously shared uh, discussions and uh, research data with me over many years. Thank you very much for your attention. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but I think that talk was so beautifully clear that, uh, and, and the ending was so, so perfect. So thank you so much, Dr. Jablonski. Our third speaker is uh, Fume Alopade, uh, the Walter Palmer Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine and Human Genetics, Director of the Center for Clinical Cancer Genetics and Global Health at the University of Chicago. She is a representative of class four, the section on medical genetics, hematology, and oncology. Uh, strange name for a section, yes. Um, and the title is Reimagining a World Without Breast Cancer. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's truly an honor to be here representing my class. Um, I'm a card carrying medical oncologists, and I treat patients with cancer. But I learned a lot from my parents, who I think were the ultimate geneticist, because um, my mother had six children, gender balance, gender equality, and all of us were treated the same in the family. Because my father really had the idea that the toughest, the oldest, has to protect the youngest. So it's all been about who is most vulnerable in our family. And so in my work, I, I came to the United States and I met Janet Rowley, who to me was the vintage ultimate geneticist who taught me everything about cancer genetics and was passionate about developing risk-adapted treatment for leukemia, uh, importance of chromosomal rearrangements and deletions, and we spent a lot of time together doing catalog of chromosomes in cancer. And that really provided the roadmap to find transformative cures for cancer. And you know, to make sure that I survived at the University of Chicago encouraged me to pursue germline cancer genetics research. 
and I never looked back. Because practicing on the south side of Chicago, this pedigree is that of a young woman. When I met her, she was in her 30s, and she had developed breast cancer twice. And being the geneticist that I was hoping to be, I told her, look, participate in our research. We found BRCA1. It's predictive of getting ovarian cancer. And if you just took out your ovaries, you will not die from ovarian cancer. And just like my father, who was actually a missionary, a pastor, believed in the power of prayers, she turned to me and said, oh, God couldn't be that unkind that I would die of a third cancer, given that I've survived two cancers. And that immediately began to really um, teach me about why science may actually make great discoveries, but if people don't change their behavior, or if the system doesn't support people to be able to change their behavior, then most of what we're doing actually wouldn't impact society. So my father would pray for women not to die during childbirth, and they would still die. That's how I became really interested in medicine, and he wanted a doctor in the family. So number five of six children became a doctor. And then I became a doctor, and our patients still wouldn't believe me that I can actually predict the fact that they're going to die from ovarian cancer if they don't take their ovaries out. So Mary Claire King and I will joke about the fact that we should have called it an ovarian cancer gene instead of a breast cancer gene. So when she died of ovarian cancer, three cancers at, by the age of 43, I then really began to think about how can we better accelerate progress in understanding the genetic basis of cancer. And so this is uh, a, a, a complex photo. You don't need to learn uh, biology to understand it. But basically, what happened was that by knowing that you can inherit a genetic mutation, you can also, without inheriting a genetic mutation, have the same phenotype of your breast cancer. So geneticists always want to, know, want to know about genotype, phenotype correlations. But for me, as a, a medical doctor, I phenotype my patients, and then I try to figure out what's going on, what's the genetic basis of it. So this paper came out really talking about the fact that if you have a BRCA1 mutation, you're going to get estrogen receptor negative breast cancer. Most of our breast cancers are estrogen receptor positive, and Charlie Hawkins at the University of Chicago won the Nobel Prize, understanding how the androgen receptor, estrogen receptor actually signal so that we can block the effect of estrogen. And that's really how breast cancer had been studied for generations, estrogen receptor positive. And we knew that if you have estrogen receptor negative breast cancer, you're going to need chemotherapy. Most women don't want to get chemotherapy. They don't want to lose their hair. It's toxic. So within medicine, medical oncologists, really, we have that reputation of carrying poisons around. But these chemotherapy agents work. They work against highly proliferative tumors. And we're able to save a lot of patients because we developed the first targeted therapy, which is chemotherapy against highly proliferative tumors. So when you have a breast cancer that's highly proliferative and you were born with a mutation, at what point should you know and how should we uh, screen you? So when this paper came out suggesting that you can also methylate your BRCA1 and the pattern of gene expression will be exactly the same as if you mutated or you were born with a mutation. Then I resolved another thought that my mother taught me, which is there's nature and there's nurture. So it doesn't matter what kind of genetic material you have, the nurture in the environment actually influences your pattern of gene expression. So that's why in this experiment, trying to categorize those who were born with a BRCA1 mutation versus this person who just had methylated their DNA, it meant that, in fact, 
there's an opportunity for us to learn about the progress of not having been born with an inherited mutation, but having the same gene altered to cause your type of breast cancer. And of course, if you have BRCA1, it means there will be BRCA2, and there's now many genes that actually predispose to breast cancer. So that's really why our lab started really pursuing the alternative hypothesis, which is if we are not born with a mutation, what are the things that actually may cause you to lose this uh, major tumor suppressor gene? And of course, having really uh, distinguished the differences, the heterogeneity in breast cancer, we now know there's a lot that we can do to target. Um, and everyone now is talking about how our immune system functions. We now know that by understanding the mutational signatures that get people to get cancer, we can target them. And that's the hope. So not only are we thinking about the truth, but the hope that by understanding the genetic basis of cancer, we're going to be able to actually develop many different uh, pathways to uh, get cancer patients to survive longer. And of all the, uh, the, the most aggressive type of breast cancer, it's the ER negative breast cancer. We talk about triple negative breast cancer because we had no target. But now, not only do we have targets, we now know that we need to study the tumor microenvironment, we need to know how the body's immune system works to prevent cancer, and that our combination of drugs have to really think about not only the immune landscape, but that it would even work better when we can augment the patient's immune system. Another lesson taught by my mother, the food you eat actually impacts what you do. And many of my colleagues study the microbiome and its importance in regulating our response. So this is the part of my talk where I then ask, what's the question about color of the skin and why black women um, have the worst outcome, even though their rates for breast cancer is much lower. And this is a country of immigrants. I came here 40 years ago. And, and the way you look at data is you can, we screen, large population screening, and you can see blacks and whites have attained equity in terms of screening. But when it comes to dying of breast cancer, uh, the successes, we have not really distributed it with, uh, with equity as a focus. So I then started asking the question, is it because of the gene or is it because of the adaptation? And I'm not going to go into the anthropology of it, but whenever we talk about health disparity, we know that it's a complex problem. But as a geneticist, what I wanted to do is to ask about whether the burden of lethal breast cancer in the African diaspora was due at least in part to differences in the distribution of heritable risk factors for the disease. Because when you think about the risk factors, my mother had six children, breastfed them for decades because she had six children over three decades. And here I am, most of us now don't even want to have children. So <laughs> her lifestyle is vastly different from mine. And so that was really why I, we then started really looking at the patterns of breast cancer. And so Dijon Ho was my first postdoc, and, uh, and Chuck Peru, you know, uh, graduating and going to Carolina. Uh, we started thinking about black patients in the Carolina breast cancer study. And then looking at the patterns, you don't need to know biology to see that the patterns differ the younger you are, the women in Ilori, Nigeria, average age of breast cancer at 48 versus Japanese women who are much older. And you can see, so this like cases where they unclassified because we hadn't seen them and they were not part of the uh, equation. So when you're looking under the microscope, you can also see different ways that chromos uh, 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 chromosomes are scattered and so the first observation we made was, yes, there's some patients who had BRCA1 mutation, but some of these patients also methylated their, their uh, uh, BRCA1. And when I look under the microscope, as Dr. Rowley taught me, there were differences in the, the, the way the chromosomes were, were scrambled. And maybe the way the chromosomes were scrambled had something to do with genomic instability and why these women were getting breast cancer so young. 
Cut a long story short, Mary Claire King and I collaborated. We went to Nigeria, Cameroon, Uganda, by here in Brazil, which has the largest population of uh, black Africans in there, and African American, and then of course the career study. The long and short of it is, these women across the African diaspora are getting breast cancer at a much younger age compared to white women who are getting breast cancer in the uh, sixth uh, decade of life. What are uh, the uh, uh, driving force here, BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALB2 are very important genes in causing genomic instability. So having made that observation, my husband who is here in the audience also was really thinking about why young uh, uh, black children in Chicago were dying of asthma. And I said, well, you know, it's, the, I, it's in the genes. And he says, no, it's in the environment. So there's a hygiene hypothesis. Let's go to Nigeria. This is pristine Chicago. And then let's go find out what's going on by going back to our medical school. And that's when he joined the consortium of asthma among African ancestry populations. And lo and behold, as we started studying the genome, we realized that there's a whole 10% of the African genome that's missing from the reference genome. And all of us are really studying the tip of the iceberg, which you heard previously. The heterogeneity, the genetic diversity on the continent is not in any textbook. So that's when we started really digging deep and saying, okay, if we're gonna understand and get to the root causes of breast cancer, we've got to study breast cancer and do whole genome uh, uh, sequencing. So you also don't need to know the biology, the bottom line is that you can see patterns. And so through pattern recognition, I love physics more than biology, but I know that here we have a lot of engineers and computer scientists that have actually brought computational biology to help us. So once I see patterns in my lab, I know that we are gonna make discoveries. So we're finding different ways to classify homologous recombination deficiency, and we're finding ways to find patients who actually, even though they were not born with a BRCA1 mutation, through the patterns, you can actually see how they may look like they have a BRCA1 mutation or a BRCA2 mutation. So pattern recognition, working with other people, we're beginning to have biomarkers that will accelerate progress. What was also really important was that we were beginning to now find why different people and so this observation of a GATA3 mutation, this is a transcription factor that no one would ever think would cause inherited breast cancer. But we see this uh, 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 GATA3 mutation in young women with breast cancer on the African continent. And we're asking ourselves the question, why? We don't know, but we're gonna study it. So now, since we don't, not, most of these women did not have uh, 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 inherited BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, what else is going on? Are we using the wrong model? Are we really bringing all of the tools we have to figure out what's going on, where a woman will get breast cancer at 25 and then die before the age of 30? So that's really the work that we're doing in our lab. And before doing that, of course, given what's in the literature, you're gonna to try to replicate your study that's been done in predominantly European ancestry groups, and every study you do will show that that's not the right causal snake. So there's the whole uh, uh, force around genome-wide association studies now, but we spent a lot of time trying to replicate what's been known among European ancestry population and realizing we couldn't do that. Lots of uh, work now in our lab to find new models to uh, understand ER negative and ER positive breast cancer. And this is the bottom line, is that if we start with African Americans that, and African ancestry that have a high rate of ER negative breast cancer, we're gonna be able to use polygenic risk score to see people who have the highest risk of breast cancer. And this is really looking at the whole genomes and ER positive and ER negative. If you look at this separation now for ER negative, we're beginning to see better, right? And it's even better spread between the highest risk individuals uh, uh, in uh, uh, African ancestry populations. So let me end by saying that we've learned a lot about how to screen for breast cancer, 
what to do about breast cancer. We can now pull a lot of risk uh, uh, assessment tools together. We can do MRI to find the earliest forms of breast cancer. We're going to do different models. And by building different models, we're going to address this global burden of breast cancer. And that's really why I came here, to get all of us excited about the possibility that we don't have to wait for three million people to get breast cancer in low resource settings and then say we can't treat them. We can't say they're poor, they're black, they, are, they live in uh, uh, urban areas or rural areas. We can actually put technology to scale and help people survive breast cancer. So that's my story. And my team is in Nigeria. They we're studying sub-Saharan breast cancer because we want to use the heterogeneity on the African continent to actually help all of us because we're all part of the human race. Uh, my team in uh, Chicago, and of course, the revelation came as we climbed Mount uh, Kilimanjaro. And my family really teach me how to walk slowly because I'm the weakest link in the family. But if I walk slowly, I'll get to the top. So thank you very much for your attention. We have time for one question. Anybody? No? Give you a second here. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Our next speaker, uh, the last speaker for this session, as a reminder, the next session, the two, next two sessions will be after lunch, uh, is Gregory Boben, Bobinger, Bobinger. He's professor of physics at Florida State University and director of the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. He represents class three, a section on applied physical sciences. And his title is Materials, Energy, Environment, and Life, Research at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. It's a great honor to have the opportunity to give this talk, and my thanks to those who extended the invitation. I will be talking about materials, energy, environment, and life, research at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. They suggested we might want to give a brief autobiographical note, and I got into high magnetic field research because of this gentleman. Peter Wolf was the director of the Francis Bitter Magnet Lab at MIT from 1981 to 1987. He recruited me in 1981 to be an MIT graduate student, and he plugged me into research at the Magnet Lab, and not just any research, but that done by Horst Stormer from Bell Labs and Dan Suey from Princeton. They were visiting users of the Francis Bitter Mag Lab. In 1982, just before I joined the group, they discovered the fractional quantum Hall effect, and in 1998, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. And I learned from Horst and Dan two important lessons about research. When the experiment is not working, from Horst I learned, go get some coffee and keep on working. <laughs> and from Dan I learned, go get some sleep and come back tomorrow. <laughs> so this is the group of five of us. This is Al Chang, who's now at Duke University, and Peter Berglund, who just retired from Aalto University in Finland. And we're celebrating, in 1984, the achievement of very low temperatures and very high magnetic fields. And the reason for that is that early research on this fractional quantum Hall effect required high-quality two-dimensional metallic samples and this combination of extremely low temperatures and extremely high magnetic fields. Well, it's since become a little bit easier to observe fractional quantum Hall effect, and so much to my surprise, it is now being explored as a strategy to realize a quantum computer. But the backstory to this photo is that this photo was taken immediately after I completed MIT's graduate student comprehensive exams, and I was convinced that I had flunked. <laughs> and so I was equally convinced that one day the caption of this photo would read, Horse Stormer, Dan Suey, Al Chang, Peter Berglund, unknown former student. <laughs> so the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory designs and builds magnets that are 500,000 to 2 million times 
more powerful than the Earth's magnetic field. It provides access for 2,000 researchers annually to do, use these unique magnets. And this talk is designed to answer the question, why would anyone want to do such a thing? Well, the MagLab is a three-site partnership among Florida State University, the University of Florida, and Los Alamos National Laboratory. It's the only facility of its kind in the United States. It's the largest and highest-powered magnet laboratory in the world. And I'll give you examples of research done by uh, a, a number of our user groups. We're funded primarily by the National Science Foundation. We also get support from the state of Florida and the U.S. Department of Energy. So how strong are the Earth's, are the MagLab's magnets? And let me first remind you that if you have a circulating electrical current, you'll get a focusing of a magnetic field that threads that circulating current. That's an electromagnet in a nutshell. So if I give some examples of magnetic fields in a solar system or a city near you, uh, we start with the Earth's magnetic field. It's a whopping 50 microtesla. The sun's magnetic field isn't much higher except at sunspots. And then a junkyard electromagnet, which has copper uh, wire around an iron oxide magnet, gets one full tesla. Uh, hospital MRI superconducting magnet gets 1.3 or 1.5 to 3 teslas. And what's special about a superconducting magnet is that it's made out of these superconducting materials that uh, conduct electricity without any friction whatsoever. So if you start an electrical current through a loop of wire that superconducts, as long as you keep it cold, that current will circulate for longer than the age of the universe. So there's literally no friction whatsoever. Well, how high are the MagLab's magnets? These are four of our world record magnets. We have the strongest MRI magnet in the world at 21.1 Tesla for research on mice and rats. Uh, we have the strongest superconducting magnet of any type, and I'll show you a photo of that, uh, at 32 Tesla. We have the strongest continuous field magnet. This is a combination of superconducting and resistive magnet uh, that gets a million times the Earth's magnetic field. And finally, if you want to get to still higher fields, you turn the magnet on and off in less than a second so that it doesn't have time to overheat and melt. And then you generate 100.7 Tesla, which is the highest magnetic field ever generated without blowing something up. <laughs> so this is the world's most powerful continuous field magnet. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more, you can see the Veritasium video on YouTube. It now has 7 million hits in a little over a month. Uh, you search YouTube for world's strongest magnet. The only thing I ask is that you not start viewing it until the next 12 and a half minutes are up. <laughs> now, it's hard to see exactly what you're looking at because this magnet is two stories tall, 10 meters tall. You're seeing the bottom third of the cylinder of steel that contains the magnet itself with all the support infrastructure. But it has a five-ton superconducting magnet that surrounds two tons of resistive magnet. That resistive magnet requires 30 megawatts of electrical power and 8,000 liters per minute of cooling water. So we can run this magnet theoretically forever as long as we can afford a $3,000 per hour electricity bill. <laughs> and when we turn on two magnets, and that's the most we can operate at one time, we're using 7% the power of the entire city of Tallahassee. Well, the MagLab attracts researchers from the round, around the world. In 2021, which was a pandemic year, we hosted experiments by more than 1,600 users from almost 160 institutions across the United States and a total of 279 institutions from throughout the world. This is what we call our Delta Airlines map. So the folks here in purple have left their home institutions to do an experiment at our uh, site in Tallahassee. Those in blue went to Gainesville, and those in red went to Los Alamos. There are magnet laboratories in Europe and China and Japan, and occasionally researchers come to our laboratories to do some experiments that re require either our unique magnets or unique techniques or unique expertise, which is what really makes the magnet lab. Education is a major part of our mission, and in 2021, we helped to train over 200 postdocs and over 500 graduate students. Our primary output are refereed papers, over 400 uh, in 2021, including six papers in the greatest publication in the world. <laughs> so there are four major MagLab research themes. 
materials, energy, environment, and life. And many of the world's scientific challenges are too big and too broad for one scientific discipline to solve. The MagLab brings together scientists from many disciplines, from physics to engineering to chemistry to biology to biomedicine, and, and, and who address these challenges with the help of the world's highest magnetic fields. So I'll start with materials. And my first message is that not all materials are found. Indeed, since 3000 BC, most materials have been invented. In fact, the last person to use entirely found materials may be the Iceman, who had clothing made of furs, a stone-bladed dagger, a copper-bladed axe. Bronze was one of the first, the earliest invented materials, a mixture of 90% copper and 10% tin. It was better than stone or copper for both tools and weapons, and it created the Bronze Age. If we leap ahead 5,000 years, uh, one of the materials that's now being studied at the Magnet Lab are high-temperature superconductors. They were discovered in 1986, and it's still not understood why they superconduct. But these materials are called high-temperature superconductors because they superconduct at temperatures up to 100 Kelvin, approximately, whereas previous superconductors were only up to around 10 Kelvin. And so that's a huge leap towards the ultimate goal, which would be room-temperature superconductivity at 300 Kelvin. Well, these early classes of uh, high-temperature superconductors all had one thing in common, a two-dimensional square lattice of copper atoms, shown here as these circles, each had one electron. And if you invented a technique to remove 6% of the electrons, then superconductivity emerges. And if you remove 17% of the electrons, for some reason, that optimizes high-temperature superconductivity. So we can make this simple phase diagram. The three phases in red we understand, the two in black we don't yet, but you can see that there's a dome of high temperature superconductivity that reaches its highest transition temperature around 17% in a dozen different materials. So the coincidence is compelling. And that dome occurs between a magnet and a non-magnetic metal. And we've since discovered many classes of superconductors that have this common phase diagram. Again, we don't understand why. High magnetic fields are required to determine what is under the high temperature superconducting dome. So from my perspective, uh, doing research in high magnetic fields, and this is the only data I'll show that comes from my own collaboration, uh, this dome was an annoyance because we wanted to know what was underneath it, what was giving rise to the high temperature superconductivity. So you need a 60 Tesla magnetic field to remove the superconductivity. And what you're seeing here at the left is the number of mobile electro electrical carriers as you remove electrons. And so as you remove electrons, you actually get more holes, as they're called, that conduct electricity. But you don't know what's happening uh, at the lowest temperatures until you turn on this magnetic field. And then you see a peak right at 17% the same doping at which superconductivity is optimized. So there's something in the resistive state at the same doping as the optimized superconductivity. So either nature is telling us something or nature is incredibly cruel. Um, and so this is the first evidence of a phase transition at absolute uh, zero temperature that seems to create or somehow stabilize high temperature superconductivity. And there have been a great number of experiments at the Maglet Lab by many other talented scientists since then that have, have illuminated this question even more. Well, the physicists have not figured out high temperature superconductivity, but the engineers decided not wait for the physicists. So in 2017, the MagLab used these materials to build a world record 32 Tesla all superconducting magnet for our user program. This is the inner coil made of high temperature superconductors. This is a close up photo of that. And this will then be inserted into a more conventional low temperature superconducting magnet to get the total of 32 Teslas. And now $5 billion of venture capital has been invested in magnets made from high temperature superconductors in an effort to realize economical nuclear fusion. Well, the MagLab's ion cyclotron resonance magnets can weigh individual uh, molecules in complex fluids. So the petroleum gets sprayed into the magnet, the molecules each orbit within the magnetic field, and that frequency of orbit is inversely proportional to their mass. So you make a spectrum, and each of these spikes 
will, have, will identify 10 to 100 different compounds, and in, we can measure the mass of all those molecules and write down their chemical formula of more than 100,000 chemicals in a single drop of oil. So if you know every chemical contained in petroleum, you can learn how to refine lower grade crude. You can learn, you can determine what's clogging your pipelines, which can cost $10 million a day. Uh, you can track the evolution of oil spills in the environment. So we can pick up a tar ball, put it in this magnet, and determine whether it comes from deep water horizon. It's not just about petroleum-based energy sources. MagLab research is also about clean energy technologies. You may know most lithium batteries today use liquid electrolytes and they can catch fire. Researchers are studying safer uh, solid electrolytes, in this case made out of a ceramic here in red and a polymer in blue. And in order to track the lithium motion in real time, researchers make the anode and the cathode, the two ends of the battery, out of lithium-6. And then initially, all of this red region is made out of lithium-7 in the pristine uh, test battery. And why do they do that? Well, lithium-6 and lithium-7 are both lithium, so chemically they're identical. But the maglev's nuclear magnetic resonance magnets can independently track lithium-6 and lithium-7, revealing that the lithium travels only through the ceramic, which suggests a strategy to improve the design of the battery. So some lithium-6 has come in here from the anode and invaded the ceramic, and some of the 7 has gone out of the ceramic into the cathode. And MagLab research is also about understanding climate change. The MagLab's powerful ion cyclotron resonance magnets enable the identification of thousands of organic compounds in six major Arctic rivers. So what researchers do is they compare data from winter and from summer when the permafrost is melting to see what the changes are. And this provides foundational data towards understanding the impact of climate change on the Arctic Ocean. And shifting now to life, the last of my categories, magnetic resonance imaging magnets have virtually eliminated exploratory surgery. This crowd, I think, knows what exploratory surgery is. My favorite part of giving a talk at high schools and junior high schools is to describe exploratory surgery. <laughs> they used to cut you open and explore. <laughs> so what doctors are doing with MRIs is they're detecting the hydrogen in the water that's everywhere in your body. That's why you get such a great 3D image of the body. The MagLab's powerful MRI magnets enable high-definition MRI to see organs in ultra-sharp focus. MagLab users can also track the diffusion of water to image nerve fiber bundles in the brain because fiber diffuses easily along the nerve fibers but has a difficult time diffusing between them. MagLab users can image individual cells with resolution as small as a few microns on a side. And at MagLab research is not just hydrogen MRI, uh, it's also sodium MRI. So this is a state-of-the-art MRI image of sodium in a mouse brain. And here you see the mouse brain tumor. Why would we put up with such a blurry image? Well, it's because dying cells absorb sodium. Even though we don't know why, we can use that fact to our advantage. So what you do is you give this mouse just a taste of a candidate chemotherapy that's too small to damage its immune system. And within four days, if the tumor lights up, we know that these tumor cells are absorbing sodium and they will die in response to a heavier dose of this particular chemotherapy. So this is the correct chemotherapy treatment to kill this specific tumor. So, User research at the MagLab advances our knowledge about materials, energy, the environment, and life. New materials with new capabilities need to be invented. My thanks to the 500 scientists, engineers, technicians, administrators, and staff who did not find the Magnet Lab, they invented it. We do have time for a couple of questions. Anybody? You're all, hear your stomach growling and you want lunch. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I <laughs> want to thank all the speakers in this session. If we can give a hand for all the speakers, I thought it was a wonderful session. And, 
after lunch, we reconvene at 1.30 for the second uh, session, which will be half uh, members elected in 2021 and 2022. And then we have the third session, uh, which will be all members from 2022. And each one will be as exciting as this one. We can promise you that. Enjoy lunch.